Let's welcome Keith to the stage. <laughs> thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. Wow, thank you, everybody. Welcome to FutureCon. It's great to see everybody come out again. Kim's right. During COVID, being in the tourism and leisure business, there wasn't a whole lot going on. Conventions like this, you know, they were taken away from us, so don't take it for granted. I ask everybody here to use this opportunity to network a little bit now that we're back out again. And if you get one takeaway from my talk, it's make at least one new connection today. So, again, my name is Keith McMenamin, pronounced McMenamin. Thank you for the opportunity to try. <laughs> I am the Vice President of Information Technology and Cybersecurity with Visit Philadelphia. I've been in the industry for 22 years. And I'm here to talk about how we can build a stronger cyber community. The community, and make no mistake about it, it's a strong community already. But there are certainly some areas that can use improvement. So let's get into it. The pillars of the community. During my time in technology and security, I have recognized five areas that I think are the rocks. And we can discuss this afterwards if you think I've missed something or you want to add because it is an ongoing conversation. But first and foremost, the practitioners, the people who put it all on the line, day to day, that do the hard work, the long hours, the sacrifices, everything that you do. Let me first say thank you to all the practitioners for everything you do. You don't hear that often enough. You are very much appreciated because you cover our backsides, you protect our businesses, our assets, our reputations, all of that. Thank you for all that you do. You need to hear that more often. And for those who work with practitioners, make sure they feel appreciated. Number two, the business leaders. The ones who, you know, security people want that proverbial seat at the table. They want that buy-in from the board of directors. And when you have that business community buy-in, it makes your program a whole lot easier to manage. Because sometimes the business side of the house, they aren't often willing members of this community. So it's up to us to invite them in. So whether they like it or not, business people, you are part of the cyber community because without you, it's not possible. Three, government. The people who make the laws and the policies that protect the people and businesses out there. They may not be a regular part of the conversation, but you know, there may be times where you have to go to them. So keep them in mind, make them part of the community. Four, educators and students. Shout out to all the educators out there, the people who sacrifice their time, dedicate their lives to advancing the profession. This needs to be a two-way conversation. So the educators, they teach the next generation, right? But it's up to us, the people doing it, to keep them in the loop of what's relevant in the field. Let them know what's really happening out in the real world so they can relay that message and keep the cycle going. And the students, not just the college kids and the people making a career change, but everybody here should be a student at certain times in their career, multiple times throughout their career. Cybersecurity is a never-ending learning opportunity, and if you don't stay relevant, you're going to get left behind quick. And last but not least, shout out to the entrepreneurs and the vendors, the big dreamers, the people who have the guts to get out there and start a company that provide us the jobs that we need to be in this field. Big shout out to the vendors, too. Without them, these events aren't possible for their sponsorship, for the technologies that they offer, for the support, because when you find a good partner, there's nothing better than having a strong vendor who has your back. So with these five pillars, you know, the community, we're going to continue the conversation of navigating the high stakes world of cybersecurity. I'm going to take a, what do they call it, the 50,000 foot view here. It, Gartner says last year alone, $172 billion was spent worldwide on cybersecurity. Let me say that again, $172 billion was spent worldwide on cybersecurity. That doesn't even count the ransom payouts and the under the table money that was going on, $172 billion. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Because my research shows that in 2025, it's estimated that that number is gonna go up to $1.5 trillion to spend. And that's on the low end. I've seen estimates as high as 10 trillion. That is a ridiculous amount of money. So I guess the good news with that is people who chose cybersecurity as a career, it's a good place to be. There's a lot of money to be made. 
So doing my research with this, I talked to plenty of CEOs, people on boards. They verify this. They recognize that cybersecurity is the, one of the biggest spends, and that number is going up. They say it's all about combating loss and mitigating risk. They're well aware that ransom and malware and social engineering and all the other pitfalls and traps, you know, not only hurts the bottom line, that could get them fired nowadays. So they're well aware that money is well spent on cybersecurity. And the good news is resources are available. With that money out there, we have great vendors in the house that are willing to help us. You know, make sure you get out to these booths and talk to the people who sponsored us today. Go out and talk to Exabeam. We have Mike McHugh in the house. We have Dark Trace in the house. We have a lot of great technologies. Talk to them. Talk, to your, talk about your pain points, your roadmap, your hopes, your dreams, your, you know, your vision for a good security posture. They're willing to help. You know, the bad ones, they'll try to pitch, 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 but the other ones, they'll partner with you. You know, they will be there, and when it's time to make a deal, then pay back the favors. <laughs> so, with that said, let's talk about some of the top threats facing the cybersecurity professional. Now, this is no particular order, but I've identified some areas that are pain points. First and foremost, it's the rising sophistication of cyber attacks. You know, back in the day, it started with the script kiddies, you know, the kids just trying to make trouble and blow things up. Then it got into organized crime. They got involved. Now we have nation state actors after it. And on top of that, generative AI has popped up its head. It's like, what's next? You know, it's going to continue to move forward and forward. And, you know, we're being asked to do more with less. So keep that in mind. Increased regulatory compliance requirements for those who deal with HIPAA, financials, um, personally identifiable information. Again, you're asked to do a whole lot more with a lot less resources nowadays. These are definite problems for people in the industry. Growing reliance on technology. I should say insecure technology. This is more for the business side of the house. They want to operate at a 10 times speed. They want everything faster, stronger, better, more agile. Kind of leaving security out of the conversation in the beginning. I think it's up to us to let them know. Keep us in mind. When you have a big idea, we need to be there at the table. It's better to get it in first than cake it in after the fact when something goes wrong. Internal dysfunction, this is a big threat, and I don't hear many people talk about this. If the ship isn't sailing right, whether it's in your own department or if it's in your organization as a whole, they're insider threat. That's a hard battle to fight. You know, they know where to hurt you. They know how to hurt you. They know where all the bones are buried. And then when they have an ax to grind, watch out because that could be bad news. So have your offboarding measures in place before it's too late. You know, once they're gone, they got to be gone. Mental health challenges too. This is a tough industry that we chose. Again, long hours, thankless sometimes. If I can give you another takeaway, make a point, use your paid time off, take breaks. Don't kill yourself over a job. You know, I know taking a day off is tough sometimes. You know, there's a lot of work, but you know what's worse? Missing an extended period of time due to your health. Some people, I've known people who've dropped dead from stress. You know, that stuff lingers in your body. Take care of yourself before anything. So how do you become an asset to the community? Let's talk about some of the good things. <laughs> Build your individual network first. Again, start with yourself. I know some people love the network. Other people, it's not that easy, right? Here's an icebreaker. If you see somebody standing by themselves, hi, what brings you here today? And just kind of let the conversation go from there. Connect with them on LinkedIn. Brick by brick, build your network because your network is your net worth. Moving forward, we can't do this alone. We're going to need people, whether it's advice. Sometimes you might need a job. Who knows what the case may be? It's good to have people by your side. Then link and integrate with other groups. We had Nancy up here with WESIS. Fantastic group. Not only for women, the mission is for advancing women in cyber and tech, but it's open to everybody. If you can be an ally, if you can be a mentor, their door is open. They helped me out coming up here today, gave some great points. You know, people I didn't even know came out of the woodwork just to help me. And it's, you know, 
We'll have to return that love some other way, but just know people are out there willing to help. InfraGuard, another one. They may have some requirements to join, but they have great um, sessions that are open to the public where I pull lots of good information. You know, look on LinkedIn, talk to your network, find, you know, get in where you fit in. There are plenty of groups out there that can help you as you go down the road. Empower each other. Again, we can't do it alone. Mention somebody's name in a room full of opportunities when they're not there. That'll come back. You know, they'll help you along the way. Mentorship, again, I'm going to end on that. Everybody needs help. Whether you can be a mentor and help somebody on their way, or if you need help, don't be afraid to reach out. There are many other ways to be an asset to the community, but I feel those are the four strongest ways to where you can give back and then receive the help when you need it. So with your network, being in cybersecurity, pretty much need a job to be a member or be in school to get there, right? So let's take a look at the job market. Some of the good, the bad, the ugly, some of the unrealistic requirements for entry level, but some of the good things as well. Again, there's a lot of money out there. Doing my research, I polled a lot of the area's leading recruiters. We had Jeff Burkhart from First Pro. We had Dave Birdwell from Topstack, Kara Cron. A whole lot of them gave me all the info I needed to put this together. So, and the data says it's still a job seekers market. That may be shifting a little bit, but right now, we're still in a good position to kind of call our shots. There still needs to be some flexibility. You know, workers got that taste of working from home, but companies want people back in office. Salaries are a little out of skew. You know, the employee has the power to kind of call their own shots if they have the right skills. Companies are trying to scale back. I'll dig into that more in a minute. But I'm told there are three top reasons why companies are hiring. First is to mitigate risk, going back to those compliance issues, you know, the ransoms, all of the bad things that can happen, they're putting butts in the seats to mitigate these risks. Two, since the beginning of business, they're in it to make money. They're hiring somebody for $100,000 a year per se, hoping to squeeze a million dollars worth of productivity out of them so their bottom line can increase. Or to save money, putting people in seats who can automate processes. They can automate operations that were once manual, that took hands-on. So these are the three things, in my opinion, and from what I'm told, why people are being hired. The Bureau of Labor backs this up. They recently estimated that the job market for cybersecurity is going to increase roughly 35%. And we already can't fill a lot of these jobs. From what I'm told, somewhere in the ballpark for every 250 cyber jobs that are posted, about 200 of them get filled, give or take. So there's already empty seats, and that's going to grow with all of that money on the table, all of these additional needs. Again, if you stay on your skills, if you continue to build yourself up, there's going to be opportunity out there. But then I talk to the job seekers. A lot of them are telling me it's still pretty rough out there. You know, even with all of these open seats and opportunities available, and it, it could be for a variety of reasons. You know, each case has its own, you know, specific rules, but it is what it is, you know, it's hard out there. And entry level requirement, people trying to get their foot in the door, if there are any hiring managers in the room, let me plead my case. It shouldn't take three years of experience, a CISP certification, and an advanced degree to get an entry level job. Like these requirements are just out of control. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, I get it. To put somebody in the seat, they do have to prove their worth somehow. I mean, you need to know the networking. You need to know code. You need to be sharp on every domain and pillar of cybersecurity, but give somebody a chance. I'm going to get back to that a little bit later too. But as a whole, this is my view on the job market, where some of the pitfalls are. And then I'm going to dive into another even bigger problem with the jobs. We need to support diversity and women in cybersecurity. I mean... Diversity adds perspective. You don't want 10 people looking like me at the table running your business. You need people with different backgrounds, different walks of life, different thoughts, different ways that they go about their business. You know, I think that once you straighten that out, you're on your way to making some really good movement and progress with your organization. Stop with the not enough mentality. You know, looking at somebody, you know, you may have a preconceived notion of who you want in that seat, but if you get a different candidate, 
You know, they may not have enough education. They may not have enough experience. You know, cut that out. You might be pleasantly surprised if you open your mind a little bit. Career gaps aren't bad. I, see, I hear and see too many times when people have extended leaves, you know, they're automatically disqualified. You know, people do need to take time off to support family for health reasons, for whatever reason that's really, frankly, none of our business. You know, some of these skills can really be transferable into the business world. Again, if somebody's qualified, give them a chance. Don't just look at a career gap because things happen. Hopefully it never happens to you. Put yourself in their seats. Have an independent review of your job postings for unconscious bias. This is surprising. Again, hiring managers at times may have a preconceived notion of who they want in that seat. Just have somebody take a look. You know, we all have our biases, whatever it may be. But just have an independent review. Make sure the best candidate has the opportunity to get the job, not just the person that you think you want to see every day. I want to encourage the women to go for it. Now, let me dig into this a little bit. My good friend Nancy Hunter, like I said, coached me out of nowhere, dropped a lot of jewels on me earlier this week. But one of the best stats that I heard, she mentioned that for a not all women, but many women, they need to feel that they have to check mark roughly 80% of the requirements before they even apply for a job. That baffled me because when I test the market, I'm winging my resume out there, right? <laughs> the worst thing they can say is no. So women, go for it. Just put it out there. If you don't apply, you already got the no. And just widen that net. You know, all you need is one yes to get that opportunity. So just go for it. Who cares? If they say no, it's their loss. That's my thought on the topic. And again, I'm just going to circle back, give somebody a chance. Somebody likely helped you get your foot in the door, repay the favor. I'm a believer in karma. It'll all come back to you. So I'm sure there are many other items that I can add to this, but for the sake of time, I'm going to leave it at these six. We can discuss it further later. Hopefully, take these points, apply them down the road. Let's make this community stronger. Oh, wait, one more. Job seekers, be ready to work for it. Once you get your foot in the door, I don't care who you are, where you came from, the expectations are going to be high. You know, don't rest on your laurels once you got that. Yes, you, ready, you better bust your hump and prove your worth day in and day out. Have that day, day's work for a day's pay mentality because if you get lazy, there are a lot of people behind you trying to get their foot in the door. Attracting and retaining talent, right? Companies, so kind of level the playing field, but... How do you keep your best talent? Like, this market's hot. People are moving left and right. The money's out there. The seats are open. How do small businesses compete with the Fortune 500s? I say first and foremost, whatever your company status is, offer the opportunity to do good work. People want to be proud of what they do, who they work for. They want to be able to talk to their friends and family about what it is that they're doing at work. You know, they want to feel good about it. They don't just want to punch in and punch out. So offer that opportunity. Provide professional development opportunities. Not too many people I know want to stay in the same job position that they had two years after, three years after they got the job. Have a roadmap. Have some goals for them to hit. Make sure they can kind of move forward in their career, whether it's within your organization or if they can gain skills to go elsewhere. It's the right thing to do. It'll keep them motivated. And in my opinion, that'll keep them around longer. Pay matters, right? I don't go to work for the fun of it. I love my job, but... Money talks, so, you know, pay up. The, the industry's changed. You know, people, the, the pay scale has increased. You know, sometimes you do just have to pony up to keep your talent. It is what it is. Reward and recognition. If somebody's doing a really good job, make sure they're recognized. And not just internally for your department. Make sure everybody else knows that this person has really gone above and beyond. You know, give a shout out. Do something to make sure that people feel valued and that their work is recognized, especially when they are sacrificing time with family and friends and, you know, real life. Strong company culture. Kind of goes back to point one, but you have to enjoy who you're working for along with what you're doing. If your culture is bad, if you hate going to work, you know, people aren't going to stay. Make sure that company culture from not just the security department, but the overall health of the organization is on point. Having a strong culture will keep people around. Work-life balance. Again, people weren't put on this earth to just work, work, work. They need to take time to themselves. They need to have fun. They need to relax. Give them the space to do that. You know, don't make it 
a pain point when somebody takes a couple days off or they want to take a vacation or something. You need to, you know, as long as they're getting their work done, my opinion is, I don't care if it's from nine to five or at midnight, as long as that goal is hit, that's good with me. I think that should be the way work is nowadays. It shouldn't just be Hawkeye, nine to five, nine to nine, whatever the case may be. Give people the opportunity to do what they need to do to stay healthy and to live their lives along with doing great work. And last but not least, Offer leadership, not dictatorship. People want to be led. They want to be inspired. They don't want a Hawkeye telling them what to do, breathing down their necks, you know, questioning their every move. Help them. Let them know what the goals are. Show them the vision. If you follow these steps, I think you have a good opportunity of keeping your talent in place instead of having to replace that never-ending wheel of open positions. So following up, I'm going to talk about how can we improve the standing of cybersecurity within the organization, not just the department itself, but in the whole company. How can cybersecurity get that respect that we deserve? First and foremost, you need to educate, not just your people and learning, but educate the business side of the house. Let the leaders know why cybersecurity is here. We're here for a reason. We're covering your backsides. We're doing everything possible to keep us in business. Learn. And that's not just the ABCs of cybersecurity, but learn non-technical talk. When you're talking to somebody from the business side of the house, don't bore them with gigabytes and logs and things. You know, talk money, talk risk, talk about things that's relatable to them. Encourage. Encourage people on the cybersecurity team to communicate effectively with other departments. You know, get to know who's in your organization, not just on your team. We need to know who's on the operations side. We need to know who's in marketing. We need to know what they're doing. That gives us better opportunity to secure. It gets us a better chance to get our foot in the door early in the process. And it takes cybersecurity into the overall health of an organization. Last but not least, promote. Promote the value of cybersecurity to the organization. How much money have you saved? What did we prevent? Don't be afraid to talk about it and kind of brag a little bit because sometimes they look at it as a cost center and it's really not. I believe cybersecurity is an investment, not a cost. So follow those four. I think you can improve the standing of cybersecurity within your organization and with the business leaders. So tips for building a culture of security within your organization. So once you get that buy-in, How do you kind of keep it going? How do you get it not only at the top level, but everybody who is a part of the process, you know, because all it takes is one person to make a false move and then we're screwed. You know, it doesn't matter if they're a receptionist, CEO, intern, wherever you are, you click that bad link, you make that false move, it's going to be a bad day for the security department. So first and foremost, understand the goals of your organization. Not just the cybersecurity department, but why is your business in business? What are they doing? Where do they want to go? How can cybersecurity and technology get them there? Earn executive buy-in. I'm going to harp on this a couple times, but it's so important to have that leadership buy-in. CEO, board, marketing, operations, finance. You know, we saw the numbers that people are spending. We need them to believe in what we're doing. And it can be done little by little. It doesn't happen in a day. Just make, make those connections and inroads. End the blame and shame game. You know, this can ruin a culture quick. Finger pointing, like we're all adults. Let people make, it's okay to make a mistake. Make sure they learn from it. But, you know, don't punish and penalize somebody if they make a mistake. You know, we, we, need, a, we need to collaborate, not to break each other apart with blame. Transparency. Have an open door policy for your team or for anybody. Come on in. Let's talk about it. Make sure the higher, you know, the higher ups are being held responsible for the directives they're giving the people, you know, coming up through the ranks. That needs to be part of the process. Awareness. And I'm not just talking about identifying like a phishing email, but why, again, why are we here? Why are cybersecurity professionals in the building? Make them aware of the risks, of the attempts, of everything bad that the actors are trying to do to bring down your organization. Increased interaction. Again, get back into it. Make sure, make a point that you interact with all departments, all aspects of the organization, not just your team in cybersecurity. 
And last but not least, incentives. Not just for the people on your team doing good work, but hey, if somebody in accounting, you know, rings the alarm on a scam, somebody called them, somebody tried to get them to wire money, incentivize that a little bit. Give them, even if it's a $10 gift card or, you know, a shout out at a staff meeting again. Make people understand that they're allowed to speak up. Get people talking about things that could potentially go wrong because if one person's getting it, somebody else on the team is probably getting it too. LinkedIn is like the playground for a hacker. They, somebody can sit back and watch every move, every hire your organization makes. So incentivize. Make sure the people are openly talking about the attempts on your organization and on your people. So the cybersecurity fundamentals, a couple check boxes here. This is not the end all be all. And I'm not gonna sit here and say, if you follow all of these, you're gonna be 100% secure. But if you follow these steps, you're well on your way to reducing a lot of risk. First and foremost is awareness training. If you're not training your staff, first thing you do when you get back to your office, sign up for Know Before, one of the other great services out there. Make sure your team knows what a phishing email looks like the different attempts that they make through phone, text message, whatever the case may be. Everybody on your staff, when you're talking to the board and the CEOs or anybody, make sure it's mandatory 100% buy-in that everybody has to complete it because IT, cybersecurity, it's not a technology problem, it's a business initiative. And if they're not doing their part, it's gonna cause a lot of problems. And if they're not doing their part, that should be a part of that person's performance evaluation every year. Phishing simulation to kind of build on top of the awareness. Fish your team, do it often. They may hate you for it sometimes, but these hackers, the scammers, they have no, no boundaries, right? Again, they'll sit back and they'll map your organization out from top to bottom. They'll figure out who the CFO is, the CEO is. They have no hesitation to impersonate these people. So... Do it before it's too late. Let your staff know some of the tricks that the bad people are trying to do. And then they know when something comes in, how to react to it. Endpoint protection. Sounds simple, right? But know what's in your environment. Have a complete inventory. Make sure everything is protected. Now with like a hybrid work environment, the landscape has changed. Not everybody's under the same roof. You know, regardless of how big your organization is, you can't make everybody's home office an extension of your office, but you can certainly make sure they are using properly authorized equipment from mobile devices, laptops, you know, across the board. Make sure they are protected. Multi-factor, it's a pain in the neck. I don't enjoy doing it, but it's a must do. If you're not doing MFA on your applications, do it now. It cuts, I don't know the exact percentage, but that cuts out a lot of the risk and a lot of the ways that the hackers and the bad actors can get into your environment. That two factor, and I, I say, you try to use an authenticator app instead of text message. If I can give a little jewel there. Um, it's just, it, the SMSs can be spoofed nowadays or finding ways around that, but the authenticator app, that seems to be the strongest method of MFA. I'm happy to discuss it in further detail if anybody has further suggestions. Pen, uh, risk assessments, penetration testing. I'm not here to tell you how often to do it because each business, each environment is different, but get it done. Having a risk assessment done is the biggest cover your backside that you can do, not only for you, but for your executive team because the days of the security head being fired are over. Somebody else is going with you. But if you have that risk assessment, if you have that penetration test done, if you follow, if you remediate all the findings, when an incident happens, you can say, hey, I did my due diligence. I did everything possible to protect this organization. And if they get in, you know, you have a little bit of CYA and an argument to say, I followed all of the steps. So if you're not doing it, if you haven't had one done within the last couple of years, plenty of vendors in the room who will do that for you. Make sure you talk to them and figure out what's the right fit for your specific need. This one, from the beginning of technology, back up, back up, back up. I can't say this enough. It's fundamental, but it's a must do and not everybody does it. Test your backups, have a version in the cloud, have a hard copy, have something off site, and make sure you know, that the backups work too. Don't wait till that oh crap moment till you're pulling out your backup and then you're like, oh crap again. I lost all my stuff. So. And last but certainly not least, have a response plan. 
It's not if something happens, it's when it's going to happen. Know what to do, know who to talk to, know what it's going to take. When that ransom, like, what is your plan? How long is it going to take to remediate? What am I going to do? Know these steps in advance before it's too late. So these are seven fundamentals. Sure, there are certainly more to add, but I think these, you know, covering these boxes will get you well on your way to a good security posture. So as we wrap up, I'm going to harp back on my key takeaways. Network, network, network. Again, build your network brick by brick, block by block. Meet people, connect with them, stay connected, pick their brains. Everybody needs help, whether you need the help or you can offer it. Make sure you do that. Take care of your mental health. You weren't put on this earth to break your back for an organization. Take your paid time off. When you're not feeling well, do it. If you see somebody who needs help, step up and help them. Take care of each other. Put yourself as a security first company. I think this is a good way to promote security as, you know, with value, not just a cost center. I think it's attractive to clients too. If you're in a business, regardless of what field you're in, if you show that you take your security seriously, I think a client or a potential client may value that and that may put you ahead of earning some additional business. Give someone else a chance, help them get ahead, do something and ask nothing in return. Karma is a good thing sometimes. It could come back in a very good way tenfold. And that's it.